Welcome back to React Native Radio Podcast. Brought to you by 2023. I just realized that there are adults who were born in 2005. Ouch. Episode 254. How can we improve React Native? Well, Robin, I'm back from the UK and back in my comfortable, warm home office here in the Pacific Northwest. It's really nice to be home. Was the UK not comfortable and warm? You know, it, the weather was actually amazing there, which is crazy because I was there in October and October is supposed to be the super re- wet, rainy season there. It was actually very nice. It, it was seems cold, like, like everywhere had a very unseasonably warm. It's true. Fall. Yeah, because I know we did here. It was It was 80 degrees right up until like the end of October. And then it was like straight into winter. Yeah, right. We didn't really get a fall. Up in Scotland was cold, but like not rainy. So I was, uh, you know, my wife and I, re- we really enjoyed it. Were you a little disappointed because you were promised rainy, <laughs> cold Scotland? You know, nobody promised me that. Uh, but I think <laughs> if I'd asked, a lot of people would have uh, just, you know, they would have bet pretty heavily on that. But it just didn't happen. So, you know, we we had a great time. It was about two weeks. We went to, well, uh, Gant and I went to React Advanced London, which was a cool conference. I hear Gant gave a pretty awesome talk. He He always gives awesome talks. This one was no exception. It was really good. In fact, if you're listening to this right now, we'll try to drop a link into the show notes and get Gant's talk in there. Uh, hopefully it's out by the time that this episode comes out. I mean, it's relevant to React Native, so. Yeah, it is. It's a, it's a React Native talk. Talks about sort of the future of React Native, which ties into our topic today pretty well, actually, because we're going to be talking about, I'm going to give a little spoiler here. We're going to be talking about how can you, how can we improve React Native? Uh, so we're going to get into that in a second, but yeah. Hey, wait, it was... wait, but before we do that, Jamin, do you have any really funny stories from, from the UK? <laughs> Are you going to do this to me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. Just a little birdie told me you had a really funny story about something that happened to you okay. in a, in a, in a restroom. It's the most embarrassing maybe? thing. And why, I don't know why you have to bring this up, but, uh, <laughs> The, okay, so funny. I, I, when you're in a different country, you know, just things are done differently. Sometimes toilets work differently. I don't know. <laughs> so I'm like exhausted from the flight. It's the first night. We're walking around Gant, Alicia, my wife Kyra, and you know we have their little uh, Gant and Alicia's three year old daughter with us, and we're all exhausted from flying nine hours or whatever it was to London and we're looking for somewhere to eat and I need to use the restroom. And there was a, there's a restaurant, but it was like, there were tons of people there. So we weren't going to eat there. We were going to try, try to find somewhere else. And, um, I spot where the, the restrooms are in the background and I go through this busy restaurant there. And for some reason, there's like 12 ladies standing outside the restroom. And it's not like they're waiting for the restroom. It's not like they're waiting for the women's restroom. They're just standing outside of the restroom talking. So this is already like making me nervous. Like, why are there a bunch of people like just standing outside the, the bathroom? Like, why do you have to be right here? You Foreboding. know, Foreboding. Yeah, this is not good. This is not good at all. I don't know if I want to tell this story, Robin, uh, but <laughs> you don't have to. It's so you embarrassing. Don't want to. So uh, I, I'm just like, is this restroom, you know, used? Uh, no, no, no. You know, uh, you can go. So I go in there and you know how some some toilets have like they have a cord that you pull. I've seen, yeah, I've seen them. And I've seen them too. Next to this toilet was a cord. Like right next to it. There's a cord. I can see where this is a going already. Yeah. Even though I've heard the story and I know where it goes. Yeah. So I go to flush. I pull the cord. An alarm goes off. <laughs> Loudly. It's just. <laughs> I'm like, holy crap. That was like an I'm fallen and can't get up alarm. Why is it right next to I guess because that's where you would fall. But well, yeah, it's an I need help alarm. Right. But you didn't need help. I didn't need help. You were just so trying I'm to like, flush okay, the well, let me shut this stupid thing off. <laughs> I can't find the shut off switch. <laughs> there's nothing on the the, the court. You pull the court again; it doesn't do anything. And I hear commotion outside, of course. And the manager's like, "Is everybody okay?" And I'm like, "Yes, I just can't figure out how to turn this off. It was on accident." <laughs> 
He's like, look underneath the t- toilet paper roll. There's a switch underneath there. I'm like, why would you hide that? Why would you hide the, the, the kill switch for this? You know? Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. You should definitely make the, the stop switch like very accessible and obvious. Yeah, just obvious with a with a label. Because if you really need help, you're not going to press the the. It like, was the underneath kill switch. the toilet paper roll cover. You couldn't see it like standing or sitting there. You couldn't see it. So I'm like, you know, after I wash my hands, I just beeline out of there past everybody. Oh, yeah. I'm just not looking at anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and then to make matters worse. Later, I go into a different restroom, and it has an actual pull cord toilet. Oh, no. And, of course, I'm just so nervous to, to pull the thing. I, I don't know. It's the worst. Now you have a phobia of European bathrooms. I do. I, I have, uh, just traveling in general is, like, distressing, you know, for, well, it for is, restroom it, use. <laughs> for restroom use. The problem is, like, the customs are all different, and, like, the... The hardware is all different, <laughs> but you're in there alone, right? right. So there's like, there's, there's no, no assistance. And everybody else knows you don't pull that cord. Very distressing. Uh, I was very tired too. I'll, I'll put that. I probably would have recognized that, hey, there's a lever too, or a button or something. I probably would recognize that if I wasn't just so jet lagged. It's dangerous to use public restrooms while jet lagged. <laughs> Apparently. Uh, I, I'm so traumatized now. I'm so sorry. That you had to experience so much pain. You're not for us sorry to enough not so to bring much it joy. up. <laughs> uh. Anyway, I'm Jamin Holmgren, your host, friendly CTO of Infinite Red. I'm back in the Pacific Northwest. I'm very happy to be back where the toilets work how you expect them to. <laughs> <laughs> I am joined today by my wondrous co host, Robin. Thank you very much. I feel much, like Robin. you want to choose a different adjective now. Trixie, annoying. <laughs> <laughs> Mazen is out with COVID. You know, Mazen, my good friend, uh, who would never bring up such a thing, <laughs> is out with COVID today. Uh, luckily, he's doing okay. But fortunately, he is doing better. But he's still in isolation. Yeah, he can't get to his recording equipment, so he can't join. Yeah, us. yeah. His his family is has not uh, contracted it. He's he's isolating. And yeah, that's Robin. Robin Heinz. Uh, she's a senior software engineer at Infinite Red. For now. <laughs> hey, I'm not like some CEOs. I don't fire people publicly. Ooh. Ba-doom. That's a subtweet. <laughs> She's also located here near Portland, Oregon, uh, with her husband and two kids, and works on React Native here at Infinite Red. Uh, this episode is sponsored by Chain React, Chain React 2023. Chain React is back, the biggest and best React Native conference in the US. We'll be back May 17th through 19th, 2023. We promise all the toilets work and there's no, actually, I can't promise that. I can't promise there's no like weird alarms that you can't shut off uh, in these (laughs) bathrooms. I have never noticed any, but maybe they've remodeled since the last time we were in there. So, you know, just uh, you've been warned. Get your tickets today at chainreactconf.com. There's some really cool uh, workshops and a lot of other stuff. Go check it out. Chainreactconf.com. All right, let's get into our topic for today. Uh, As I alluded earlier, how can we, how can we improve React Native. And there was, uh, just as context, uh, over the years, the React Native core team has posted in the discussions and proposals repository a discussion asking sort of, you know, what sucks about React Native? How can we improve it? What are some, you know, what are the highest priorities? It's a really great way to kind of gauge, you know, the, the, I guess the mood of the the community and, and prioritize what things to work on, which is really fantastic. So this was uh, posted uh, mid-October by Luna. Uh, Luna Leaps is her GitHub handle, and she's on the React Native core team. And uh, she says, the React Native team is looking for feedback to improve the developer experience of React Native. Our team has gotten so much value from the past responses in 2018, 2019. Uh, We missed 2020 and 2021. This year, your input matters more than ever as we look to prioritize your feedback into our planning. I really love this. I, I think it's one of the coolest things. It's now locked. Uh, So now that kind of people have had their chance to get feedback in, uh, now we're going to go over kind of the top uh, requests and just talk about them. Ironically, the first comment, which has a lot of conversation under it, is actually something that most people disagreed with. Uh, Somebody pointing out that they would like the two platforms to be more similar in terms of UI between iOS and Android, similar to 
the way Flutter does it. Mm -hmm. And it actually got quite a lot of negative response of people saying, no, I like that about React Native. Like that's one of the defining features of React Native is that it honors the platform specific UI differences. That is one of the differences from Flutter for sure. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of conversation under it. People saying, no, like, please don't change that. We like that they're different. That's yeah. one thing that makes React Native special. And I think one of the most compelling kind of responses was you look at a native alert dialog for iOS and Android, mm -hmm. um, and they they look different. And I think if you put an iOS alert on an Android app, the Android users would be oh, like, it what would is this? Like, yeah. Well, yeah. and But you wouldn't. Yeah. I don't actually know what Flutter alerts look like, but I'm guessing in Flutter, the alert is a third option that looks nothing like either of the two native. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, sort of material UI or something. But yeah, I would agree with that. Which I know, like, I know some some apps, that's what they want to do. They don't like that the system UI sort of takes you out of the app's branding right. and everything. And so they want a more customized experience, which you can do. Yeah. There's plenty of ways to do a custom dialogue, but out of the box, the alert component that you get with React Native will honor the, the system yeah. dialogues, which are familiar to users. So that was one of the very first discussions or comments that was that was added that sparked some discussion. There's some, some of the most requested things also got a lot of conversation, including a conversation about yoga. The layout engine. Yeah. Which kind of mod it's it sort of like emulates CSS, but it's not one hundred percent like right. full implementation of CSS. And it sounds like like CSS has has advanced and and grown and added a lot more features, and yoga hasn't really kept up with everything that CSS can do, including CSS Grid. I remember suggesting like, hey, we need CSS Grid, and I think it was probably I don't know 2018, 2019, in yoga, and I remember the response from the core team back then was. Why do you need that? <laughs> Which uh, was actually a fair point, to be honest, back then. I didn't really need it. It was just sort of a cool feature I wanted to play with. You know, you can do just about everything with Flexbox. But it seems like this has grown in popularity now. This is definitely, it was sort of like the top voted suggestion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some people are saying like yoga was sort of considered complete by mm -hmm. Facebook and not, yeah. or sorry, by Meta and not getting any attention anymore. So a lot of people really echoed that. And it sounds like they're working on it. I don't actually know how yoga will tie into fabric with the new architecture. Is yoga still going to be relevant? There's some rumors that there's a different layout engine being used internally at Meta, not yoga, sort of like a yoga successor that Which works kind more of, like CSS. kind of explain why it hasn't gotten a lot of love. Yeah, there's no internal ownership of, of yoga from what I understand, or if there is, it's, it's new. And that's part of why it kind of stagnated. It's not just the layout, though. It's there's other stuff. There's like, you know, fixed and sticky position. There's mask, clip path, uh, filter, multiple shadows, maybe even just shadows that work consistently on iOS and Android. One comment highlights the gaps that they think are the, the, the most prominent uh, fixed and sticky position, mask and clip mm -hmm. path, like you said, multiple shadows, filter. For things like blur 20 pixels. I don't know what that is, but yeah, I never use CSS, so I don't know about all these things, but they sound cool. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there, there's a lot of things you can do with CSS that, that you can't do with, with React Native. So that is something that is pretty popular here. So there's a comment from Nick Girlman. I don't know if he actually works at Meta or not, but um, he said the issue is very directly on his radar. Mm -hmm. right now and gap row gap column gap will be here soon so it sounds like there's things coming yeah to yeah. address this which is good that is good the next one i think is probably my top thing and that is debugging with flipper or just debugging in general flipper has so much potential to be awesome yeah but right now it is as the the, the author of this one says unbearably slow and buggy it's true it's slower to boot than both xcode and android studio and that's saying something <laughs> i'm so sorry to whoever like works on flipper currently or worked on it in the past yeah yeah it's not a very pleasant tool to use and there's been times like long periods of time where i just couldn't get it to work at all like 
I don't know, there was some version incompatibility with Node or with React Native. I don't know. I couldn't. And there is, there's just very little documentation. There's very little right. troubleshooting help on the internet. And I, I haven't, like, wasn't able to solve the issue. So, yeah, it's in theory, Flipper could be amazing and, like, very critical for debugging, but it has to work in order for that to be. Yeah, it does. And, and I think one of the worst, you know, sort of like comments here was when people ask me, what do you do to debug React Native? I simply avoid mentioning Flipper. Yeah. <laughs> so, obviously, making it, <laughs> it, it just needs some TLC. It does. It does. It needs to be like they need to use Flipper on Flipper. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so there's a lot of stuff there, you know, that that I think needs to be Im- Im- improved quite a bit. They do, they do. Uh, some of the things that are mentioned here are like, you know, like network inspector, you know, state inspector. We have those in Reactatron, which it, there is actually a Flipper plugin for Reactatron. You can use it in Flipper. Yeah, I primarily use Reactatron for my day to day. Yeah. Speaking of apps that need some TLC, <laughs> yeah. but. That will eventually happen. We're going to put some time into it, but it's still useful. There, I mean, there are some things that it doesn't do, like yeah. perf- like the the performance tools in Flipper are mm-hmm. like, you can't get them anywhere else. Like the flame graph is so useful yeah. when you can actually get the thing to work. Yeah. And uh, the, the nicest thing about uh, Reactatron is that it's super lightweight and you know, oh, loads yeah. up quick and very light. Things like that. I mean, so. like when you just when you just need to inspect your state and like see what your network calls are, what your Redux actions are, it's right there and it's easy and fast and useful. So one of the comments is Flipper uses many CPU resources, so I don't use it. I still always have Reactatron in the background. <laughs> so, uh, so someone likes uh, Reactatron. Someone likes Reactatron. I actually think uh, Reactatron is more probably more like beloved than then we might even know because we don't have any like you don't always need heavyweight debugging like right there are times when you really need heavyweight debugging but most of the time you you don't yeah so the next one is a familiar one (laughs) upgrades upgrades everybody's favorite thing it's like upgrades react native upgrades are like dishes everyone hates doing them but you have to and then as soon as you're done it feels like you have to do it again (laughs) I love that. And the React Native upgrade command doesn't even work for new apps, which is sort of like, hey, you have a dishwasher that even if you put a clean dish in, it doesn't come out clean. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to oh, do it by hand. I don't use the upgrade. Com- I don't think I've ever used the upgrade command. I don't trust it. I don't, I don't know anybody that does. With like apps that I've cha- like added a bunch of native packages and changed like all the configure. No, I wouldn't trust an upgrade command to do it for me. There is a comment, upgrading an app with Expo is a delight. I can't say the same for React Native CLI. So that is true. Expo's upgrading process is very nice. In fact, Expo kind of solves this issue, but not everybody uses Expo. So, you know. Is that still true with the sort of new era of Expo with EAS and more? I think it's largely true. Um, I think that anytime you add more power like that, you're going to end up with more complexity, I guess. Well, I mean, it's it's, it's moving to a less controlled environment right Mm -hmm. i mean traditional or like classic expo they maintained a lot of control over the native side so they could just like update react native in the sdk and release the new sdk and that's your upgrade basically whereas like new new era of expo like you're letting people modify the native code and add their own native packages and it gets more complicated yeah it's sort of like apple's way of doing things where they like they control everything so Mm -hmm. that like they can (laughs) make the user experience really like pristine and seamless and android lets you do more customization and stuff and so it's a little more rough around the edges it's worth noting that flutter's upgrade process is actually very easy and simple and they still have a lot of power so they anyone think you're biased against flutter right i you know that is something they've really they have really dialed in yeah which is important, little, like little DX developer mm-hmm. experience, um, things like that make a big difference in adoption. In that discussion, did they say anything about whether they're changing, have any plans to improve the upgrade experience, or is it just kind of like, it sucks to suck, it's going to be hard? Yeah, to they didn't really respond to it. So <laughs> <laughs> cool. we'll see. 
Right. So um, the next one is another one of everyone's favorite topics. Enabling the new architecture is like mm-hmm. the, the buzzword of the year. Yeah. And this is sort of related to upgrades in some ways. Right. <laughs> so it's kind of the same complaint. There's just not a not a ton of support for how to upgrade from old architecture to new architecture. I th- Obviously, they're they're working on it. We've talked about this on the podcast a little bit. One of our our own engineers did some work documenting the new architecture. I think there's some there's some docs up already on the main React Native doc site, correct? Right. Yeah. There's so it's something they're working on. Yeah. Slowly, documentation is being added around this and and what to do. I think you know there's there's a comment by Tom Sherman on this. He says our medium large app had 37 native dependencies in June of this year. 32 needed support added for the new architecture, and there's still 32 that need support added for the new architecture at this point. Uh, new architecture has a critical mass problem. It's not worth it to library maintainers to add support because there's not enough users that need it, but there's not enough users because none of their dependencies support it. And that's fair. The React Native team is working on this. They have, uh, there is a website, reactnative.directory, and and they have added a little new architecture flag on you know, oh, like I'm looking right now at the main, like the homepage, and it says React Native Community slash Date Time Picker, and there's a tag MIT License TypeScript Types and New Architecture. So uh, they have a way of doing that. They're, I think they actually like auto detect whether the new architecture is supported oh, nice. or not. I didn't know about that. Yeah, That's it's a really it's useful pretty cool. list. Yeah, there was also a a GitHub issue that Lorenzo linked which has a, a list of known libraries and their ar- new architecture statuses. But it sounds like maybe that's been integrated into the directory yeah. site that you've just linked. Yep. And one of the ones that I'm involved with is React Native WebView. And Thibaut Macho is is currently working on the new architecture uh, transition. But it's it's a pretty big job. So, you know, it's taken some time. I think he started it early this year <laughs> or like May or something. I'm I'm guessing... That the reason there's not a lot of information about what the path forward looks like is because maybe the people at Meta don't quite know what the path forward looks like. It's a very complex problem. And yeah, it's it's not like they're not like capable of documenting things really well. So I think if like those docs don't exist yet, that means it's it's a really tough and complex problem and they're working on it. And yeah. And, and one of the things to, to remember is that the React Native team at Meta is actually pretty small. Um, they have full-time engineers on it, but they're, you know, they're, they're having to fix bugs and, and, you know, kind of handle releases and all that. And so that's one of the reasons we've been working with them to kind of help them with, uh, the documentation for the new, new architecture. But yeah, it's taking time. My, my sort of internal estimate is nine months to a year before it starts becoming really viable. So, you know, November of next year, hopefully. I think it's going to definitely going to take some uh, community leadership. That's for sure. Uh, yeah. I think the the major packages are going to have to sort of step up and take the lead and like encourage others to come along with them. Yeah. And we'll figure it out together. And I think that um, one of the next ones, I, I don't want to skip ahead, but one of the next ones, well, I, I will skip ahead because there, there's one... Uh, Aditya, uh, who is a cool guy, he actually comes and chats on my on my stream sometimes. He said, uh, these are some things I'd like to be addressed and fixed. The new architecture is out, but there are no performance benchmarks to see what benefits we're getting. And I think that's one of the big things. Like, if it feels like we're not getting any benefits from all of this work, then what is the point of upgrading it? Yeah. If that's a lot of work to, you know, what what are we getting? And I think the the core team still needs to do a better job of explaining what we're getting. A lot of the benefits feel like things that Meta, that Facebook specifically, is dealing with, and not so much things that maybe our clients are dealing with. There was a in one of our more recent We React to News episodes. I don't remember if you were there. I think it might have just been me and Mazen. Mm, yeah. Um, but we talked about this this guy that's doing a Twitter. Uh, he's like regularly posting on Twitter every day about a different benchmarking experiment he's done with the new architecture. Mm-hmm. Um, and showing like the performance gains. Um, I'll we'll link to that episode in the show notes because I thought it was super interesting. But so yeah. it seems like there are people that are starting to to experiment with it, but not seeing anything official from Meta is frustrating. Yeah. 
Uh, the one I skipped over was better built-in images and image caching. Uh, it seems strange to have to reach for a third-party library like React Native Fast Image or React Native, Native Image Cache to, you know, when, when the built-in image component should be able to do this by itself. And I think I agree with this. Uh, we always are adding, you know, React Native Fast Image or React Native Image Cache. We pretty much always use Fast Image by default. Ignite yeah. uses Fast Image. Yeah, it's just built in. Yeah. So why not have it built into React Native? That's a fairly basic thing. That, although, obviously, they don't want to have too many of the third-party stuff in there. But, um, but yeah, I think that's good. Uh, yeah. No documentation around concurrent rendering. Any benefits or benchmarks is back to Adidas comment. Um, document the native areas. There's, it's a lot of documentation that's missing. There are some React Native packages that are abandoned. And that's, that's really kind of uh, unfortunate. It's happening more and more. Yeah. I mean, React Native was new and exciting right. five years ago. And there were packages all over the place. And they were still new and maintained. And now those same packages that we used to reach to every single time are now... They haven't changed. <laughs> four, five years. Like, you'll look down the commits and you'll see four years ago, three years ago. And it's just happening more and more. Yeah, for sure. There are a lot of really well-supported packages, but a lot of them are by Expo, by Shopify, you know, by by some of these, you know, more more active people. Microsoft. Well, yeah, the the ones that have corporate or enterprise sponsors, basically. Yep. I mean, it's the companies that are relying on on React Native for their product. React Native gifted chat is one that's sort of been kind of abandoned, and I, that's mm-hmm. that's unfortunate because it's a really really cool one. But the maintainer hasn't commented on there in ages. And there's not a lot of other chat UI libraries because it's so overwhelming to be a single person maintainer of a library used by. It is hundreds of thousands of people and you're not getting compensated for it so you only have so much time and eventually if you burn out then what happens you know it's just a it's a broader problem with open source it is that's why at the end of the day you end up with corporate sponsors of open source and that's pretty much your your main focus right who are trying to protect their investment and with good reason yep and they have the resources to to devote to maintaining open source which is great Please fix the modal issues. <laughs> that's that's a big one. Modal is is kind of useless uh, in React Native right now. Everyone seems to be using uh, Gorham's React Native bottom sheet. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, like we were just talking about, I'm fearful that it will succumb to the same issue because it's this guy doing this essentially alone and everyone is starting to use this library and demand more and more and more yeah. from him. and. I'm worried that he's going to burn out as a maintainer. Yep. And this library that we have discovered and is great. Let me hit a few more really quick. Uh, please give us a nice performant list component. So obviously Shopify's flash list is a step in that direction. And actually we just, we just implemented flash list on a client project and it made a big difference in performance wise. Keyboard handling in React Native apps, there's, it's way harder than it should be. It's, you know, keyboard avoiding view is just too basic. Keyboard aware scroll view, which is a library, is what we've had a lot of success with. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, the community libraries are coming through for that. But Yep, exactly. React Native keyboard manager, but that's only iOS. Yeah, keyboard aware sc- scroll view is the big one. Uh, does work with Expo. There's some other stuff, too. But um, those are those are main the main uh, issues with keyboards. And it's actually one of the reasons Ignite is so nice. You know, Ignite being our boilerplate, we implement these things that we think should be in React Native, but we just bring them in so you don't have to think about them. They're just available. Disclaimer, keyboard avoiding scroll view is not actually in Ignite, but it should be. Oh, really? Okay. Well, that's something yeah. we should think about if we're using it in real projects. Maybe yeah. it will be by the time we get uh, it's this possible. episode. <laughs> <laughs> next, uh, next time you stream, we'll add keyboard aware scroll view. This is a big one. Uh, improving the log box. It is heavy. It, you know, it, it does a lot, but it also like, I don't know how many times I look and I see, you know, just useless stack traces that don't actually tell me what's going on. So often. I, I, I remember when I was first learning programming and I was using Rails and like the, the error experience was so good because yeah. like you get this error comes up. You have your stack trace, you have a REPL, so you can like see what values of all your variables are at that 
exact point, super useful, was super spoiled by that. The React Native Air experience is a lot of times really frustrating because the stack traces yeah. are meaningless. Yeah, I think that's probably my top one. I want to see more of that. There's a lot more here. I want to really quickly touch on a few. By the way, a real quick, uh, going back to yoga, Nick Ger Gerleman said that he has been working on yoga and they've been, you know, improving their issue responses, you know, because like an average time to first response of 800 days. <laughs> I, I sometimes feel bad about my, uh, days. my response uh, times, but 800 days, that's, that's a bit. What is that? Two, two and a half years. Yeah. And that's for pull requests for community issues. 1,354 oh, days. No. So that's the average uh, time to first response. But they have been working and uh, there are issues, there are pull requests, things are moving forward over there. So that's good. There's uh, a note about having Metro being able to follow sim links. And it is actually people, it is moving forward. There is also our next kit, which Kelset links to improve promises, rejections. We see this all the time. Possible unhandled promise rejection. We don't know where, <laughs> just somewhere, you know, it's just common. And then you're like, where, you know, what do we do here? First class support for suspending inactive screens. You know, uh, that's, that's another thing. So that it's a performance. Yeah. Reduce memory. Exactly. Yeah. Improving debugging with Chrome dev tools. That's a big one. Making sure that it's better. Uh, adopt React Native web. Yes. I agree with this one that there's, there doesn't seem like there's any real acknowledgement from Meta that React Native Web exists, but it's a lot of people are trying to use it and do use it for their cross-platform apps. So it's, uh, yeah, some acknowledgement would be good. Yeah, that's big. It, this just keeps going and going. Yeah, there's a lot. We're def definitely not going to be able to hit them all. We're not going to be able to hit them all. It's almost like we need a part two on this, but <laughs> Kiara from uh, the React Native Windows team says the, the breaking changes that come from React Native in the last year have put stress on our team and our customers. We've heard recurring feedback from our customers that the cost of breaking changes is high and the pace at which breaking changes are occurring is furthering the challenges. We'd like to see more stability in React Native. And uh, I can definitely say that that's also the case. Maybe that's why they haven't gone 1.0 yet is because of all these. It's, uh, it, there, there's a lot of work to be done <laughs> on React Native. Here's the good news, just to wrap all this up. The core team is asking about this stuff and they are working on addressing it. And so that's, that's fantastic. If they weren't aware of it, then we couldn't really have, I guess, hope that it'll get addressed. React Native is really awesome, uh, but it definitely has a ways yeah. to go. If the core team hears this, it sucks to hear everyone talk about everything you're doing wrong, and it can probably feel really demoralizing. We think React Native is awesome, obviously. Infinite Red's entire business model is on React Native. We it love is. React Native. It's amazing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this kind of thing is because we love it so much, and we want it to be like the best it can be. And that's never going to happen if the, like, the issues that, that the community is having aren't like brought to light. So that's yeah. why... And obviously, you know that because you like specifically solicited this feedback. But exactly. We know it's hard to hear and we love you. <laughs> well said, Robin. <laughs> well, thank you very much uh, for your thoughts there. And yeah, thanks to everybody who's working on this. If you'd like to nerd out more about React Native, I am back streaming more regularly. Check out my Twitch stream at rn.live. You can go to youtube.infinite.red. I'm also on Twitch. You can also join our Slack community at community.infinite.red. I actually just polled them recently to see if we should move to Discord. 95% said stay on Slack. So I was like, okay, the people who want it, want Slack are here. There are over 2,000 React Native developers in there. So go check it out. You can find Robin at Robin underscore Heinz on Twitter. Uh, you can find me at Jamin Holmgren on Twitter for now. You can find Mazen, who's not here, at Mazen Chami. Wish him a speedy recovery. You can find React Native Radio at React Native RDIO. As always, thanks to our producer and editor, Todd Worth, our assistant editor and episode release coordinator, Jed Bartoski, our designer, Justin Husky, and our guest coordinator, Derek Greenberg. Thanks to our sponsor, Chain React. Go check it out, chainreactconf.com. And thanks to you, of course, for listening today. Appreciate it. Rom, do you have a mobbing joke today? I do. Let's hear it. What's the difference between a duck and George Washington? I don't know. One has a bill on his face and the other has his face on a bill. <laughs> uh, <ba> <laughs> all right. We'll see you all next time. Bye. Bye.